Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that Christians are to be salt and light in the world. But unfortunately, all too often, I'm not sure we are perceived that way by the world. What do people outside the church think about people inside the church? A lot of research has been done on that question to explore the answer to that question. But if you're like me, you really don't need research to know the answer. You interact with non-Christians. Maybe you work with people who don't go to church. You've had conversations, and you've probably heard the complaints about Christians, the complaints about church. Just a bunch of hypocrites. Christians are judgmental. They're hard to get along with. They are rude. These are the kinds of things that we hear sometimes about the church, about Christians. And that's so unfortunate. And maybe, yes, maybe that comes from a broken heart that has been hurt by the church or someone who feels like the church has really burned them. Or, or maybe it's, it's from a place of, of disappointment or maybe it's even a place of uh, just feeling guilty of maybe not being involved in the church themselves or feeling threatened uh, by the church or by Christians. There's probably a number of different reasons. Maybe some people are simply just echoing some of the stereotypes that they've heard for a long time. And we all know those stereotypes are out there. But maybe, maybe people are saying these things because they actually know a Christian or two who don't represent fully Jesus Christ. Maybe they say these things sometimes because their impression of Christians or the church is tainted by people who claim to be Christians, but who don't live that way. As Gandhi famously said about the church, I love your Christ, I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Now, if you're like me, your natural response to that is something like this. Now, wait just a second, Mr. Gandhi, and anyone else who says something about the church. You don't get the full picture. You're not seeing everything. You don't know all the good that we are doing in the world. I think so often our natural instinct is to get defensive, to defend ourselves. That's not true. That's not right. But maybe it's important for us to stop, to stop and to really take a good, long look in the mirror and to really see what it is we are portraying to the world. If we are representatives of Christ, are we representing him fully and accurately? Is it possible that our portrayal of the heart of Christ is somehow distorted or diluted in some way so that people get the wrong idea about Jesus? Now, yes, we can't control the universal image or the perception of the church or of Christianity. We cannot. But we can control us. And we can determine ourselves how we act and interact and treat other people. That is within our sphere of influence. And so maybe it's important for us to stop and to listen and to stop and to look and to say, what are we showing the world when it comes to Christ? And so as we continue this series, we're calling Being the Body. We're going to ask the question today, if we had the heart of Christ, if we had the heart of Christ, what would we feel? Or how would we approach people? Or how would we interact with people? How would we respond to people? I guess there's a lot of different directions we could go with this idea of the heart of Christ. We could talk about the emotions that Jesus certainly felt, the emotions and the feelings that he had as he lived on this earth. And certainly, he felt a lot of different things. He was fully human. And so, he felt sorrow. For example, in Gethsemane, he wept, he groaned, he rejoiced, he expressed love. I suspect he must have felt betrayed when Peter denied him and Judas betrayed him. And there were probably times, I would guess, because Jesus was human, that he was probably frustrated or upset, or tired. But rather than talk about the emotions of Jesus as we think about the heart of Christ, I want us to think about a different aspect. 
I want us to think about how Jesus interacted with people, how he responded to people. When someone says, you know, she has a good heart or he has a good heart, we know what that means. That means that's a good person. That's a nice person. It's someone I'd like to be around. Well, Jesus had a good heart. And he calls us as his representatives, as reflections of him, people being made into the image of Christ, to be people who have a good heart. And so today, look at Matthew chapter 9, a passage that was read just a few moments ago, a great summary of the ministry of Jesus. Matthew 9, verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Isn't that a great summary of the ministry of Jesus? He went around the countryside interacting with people, proclaiming the good news, healing their diseases, doing miracles, calling other people to to go out into the world and and share the gospel. If someone said, write a hundred-word essay describing what Jesus did, that would be a pretty good answer, wouldn't it? But I think there's more going on here. This is more than a summary of Jesus' ministry. This is more than a geographical marker. Jesus went here and there and he did this and that. There's something in ancient manuscripts called inclusio. It was something that writers would use to draw attention to something in the text. You know, we today have have different structures we use and punctuation and we highlight and underline and we set apart you, you do know that the, the chapter numbers, the verse numbers, the headings in some of your, your uh, manuscripts above the paragraphs, we've added all of that to help us better process and understand the scriptures. But the ancient writers inspired by God used verbal ways of doing that. For example, they would repeat something to call attention to it. Where we might underline something, they would repeat something so that it would really stand out. The inclusio is one of those verbal devices written devices to use. And basically what it is, is it's, it's bookends, verbal bookends, brackets. And so something was said to begin a thought, and then something very similar was said at the end of the thought as bookends. And then the focus is on what's in the middle. It would highlight what's between the bookends. It appears to me and many others that this text in Matthew chapter 9, at the end of that chapter, is the second bookend in this inclusio. Okay? Sounds great. What's the first book in? Well, back up to Matthew chapter 4. And if you actually have a paper Bible, I know those are somewhat rare these days, but if you have a paper Bible, you can sort of see it a little easier than you can on your phone or device. But back up to Matthew chapter 4. Look at verse 23. See if this sounds familiar. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It sounds very much like the end of chapter 9. You see, those are our bookends, our brackets. And so our attention then is drawn to what is in between those brackets. Well, what's in between those brackets? Well, it's Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7. And then it's this collection of his miracles in chapters 8 and 9. His teaching and his miracles, the very core of his ministry. And the focus of it all, don't miss this, the focus of it all is how to live among and love other people. That's the focus. How to extend mercy and love and grace and compassion to others. I mean, think about it. The Sermon on the Mount begins with Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. When someone curses you, don't curse them. What do you do? You bless them. Pray for your enemies. 
If someone hits you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek. You don't get revenge. If someone takes your shirt, you offer your coat as well. Give to others, but give discreetly. Do not judge other people. You see, it's all about how to live among and love others. And then you read these miracles in chapter 8 and chapter 9. Jesus heals this man with leprosy, but he doesn't just snap his fingers to heal the man. What does he do? He touches the man. He touches the untouchable, someone who has probably not been touched in so long. He heals Peter's mother-in-law who is sick, the centurion's servant, people who are demon-possessed, paralyzed man, Jairus' daughter, the bleeding woman, two men who are blind and couldn't speak, on and on. All that Jesus did and all that Jesus taught was infused with remarkable compassion. His words and his actions flowed out of a heart full of love and kindness. Look at our main text again, Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's Old Testament language there. Throughout the Old Testament, God's people are referred to as sheep, sort of wandering around, needing a good shepherd. And Jesus has a heart for the harassed and the helpless. You see, this vivid description of Jesus gives us a glimpse of the heart of Christ. Jesus cared deeply for those who were harassed and helpless, those who had very little social leverage to improve their standing, to defend themselves, those who had very little resources to provide for themselves, those who were marginalized and mistreated. In society, Jesus had a heart for them. He cared for them. He extended mercy and love to them. How can the church claim to be the body of Christ if we are not being the advocates for those who are harassed and helpless in our world today? How can we do that? How can we claim to be the body of Christ today? If we aren't advocates like Jesus was for those who are harassed and and helpless, those who are marginalized, too often, unfortunately, not only are we not advocates for them, but we even sometimes add oppression to them and mistreat them. Jesus pursued people in need with a heart of compassion. He went to them. He didn't avoid them. He didn't ignore them. He didn't bypass them. Do you remember what it said? He went throughout the countryside, throughout the towns and villages, seeking them out. He entered into that sometimes messy and often complicated space of human need. And when he was there, he extended mercy and love. That's just who Jesus was. So many examples throughout the Gospels. Matthew chapter 15, after healing crowds, multiple people with multiple ailments, surely Jesus is tired, surely he's exhausted, but we read these words, Jesus called his disciples to him, and he said, I have compassion for these people. These people are in need. I can help meet their need. I can extend grace and mercy and kindness to them. Jesus has compassion on them. Mark chapter 10, you may be familiar with the story of the rich young ruler, someone who says he wants to follow Jesus but seems to be more in love with his money and possessions than he is with God. So here is someone who Jesus disagrees with. They don't see eye to eye. They're not on the same page. Sometimes those people are hard to be kind to, aren't they? But I want you to notice what the text says about Jesus' response. Mark 10, 21, Jesus looked at this man and he loved him. It doesn't say Jesus looked at him and judged him. It doesn't say Jesus looked at him and dismissed him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. His heart went out to him. Matthew chapter 14, Jesus has just found out about John the Baptist and his beheading. 
Surely Jesus is upset. He needs some time alone to process this, to pray about it, to deal with the emotions of that. And yet, there are people in need. Matthew 14, verse 14. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. And he healed their sick. There are so many other examples of Jesus extending mercy and kindness to people. You see, compassion was Jesus' primary response to people in need. Compassion is what he met people with. That word compassion is an interesting word. We don't really use it that much today, do we? But it's used throughout the biblical text, especially to talk about God and to talk about Jesus. And the word means to be moved from deep within. In fact... (laughs) If you look, it literally means to be moved in your bowels. (laughs) For them, in ancient society, that's where the seat of emotion and the seat of uh, pity and love really was. And so it means to be moved from deeply within, to show compassion. Jesus had a good heart. It seems like an understatement, doesn't it? But it was from that heart that he chose, that he chose to constantly extend kindness to others. And that's what we must do. As the body of Christ in our world today, we must extend the heart of Christ, which means we need to be kind. We need to show compassion, just like Jesus did. Someone says to me, why are you making such a big deal about being nice, about being kind? What people really need is to hear the gospel. And I would say two things to that. Number one, I'm making a big deal about being kind and nice because Jesus made a big deal about being kind and nice. He taught it. He lived it. Not on one occasion, not just occasionally throughout his ministry or life. But compassion and kindness permeated everything he did and said. To Jesus, kindness is a big deal. The second thing I would say is this. You're right. People need to hear the gospel. Kindness is no substitute for communicating the gospel. But kindness is often the best catalyst for communicating the gospel. Yes, People need to hear the gospel, but people also need to see the gospel. They need to experience the gospel. You see, love expressed without teaching is incomplete. Social justice is great, but those acts of justice, those expressions of love must be connected to Jesus, must be overtly connected to Jesus and the gospel message. Teaching and preaching is great, but teaching without love expressed, not just saying, oh, I love them. Teaching without love expressed is also incomplete. Compassion and kindness authenticate the message. Let me say that again. Kindness and compassion authenticate the message. I miss my neighbor. I'll call him John. John and his, li- and his wife were probably in their early 60s, mid-60s, and they were one of our neighbors who lived across the street and diagonal to us. And we knew most of our other neighbors. In fact, we would often be outside and talk a lot to our neighbors. But for John and his wife, we really never really had that connection. We didn't talk that much. He knew I was a preacher, and I suspect maybe that scared him off a little bit. Sometimes being a preacher does that. I, I think they think I'm going to proselytize them or sneak over and baptize their cat or something. I don't know. (laughs) Just some people are leery about that. And so we just basically did the nod or the hi when we pulled in our driveways and went on about our business. But one day several years ago is when we had one of those big snows. There's a lot of snow on the ground. And Riley and I decided to slosh across the street with our shovels and, and shovel the snow on John's driveway. And so we did that. He was away at work. And I think that small act of kindness cracked open the door. It wasn't long after that that 
John's mother-in-law passed away. She had been living with them so John's wife could take care of her. And she passed away, and so Carrie Ann went over to their house to extend our sympathies, and she took some food with her. And our thought was, well, she'll probably just give it to her at the door and, and uh, go on about her business. But John's wife invited her inside, and they sat down, and they talked. And they talked at length. Carrie Ann was able to minister uh, to this woman and to talk about things that matter. You see, kindness opens the door to conversation. Conversation about important things. Life-changing conversation. Kindness is so important. And so the Apostle Paul would write things like he wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You see what Paul is saying? God is the example. God, through Christ, is the example, the pattern. Show kindness and compassion and forgive like he does for us. Have the heart of God. Have the heart of Christ. For most of us, we see that. We can read the Gospels and we can see how Jesus interacted with people. How he touched the untouchable. How he always extended kindness to people and compassion The challenge is not seeing the heart of Christ. The challenge is actually living with the heart of Christ, isn't it? Because let's be honest, some people are hard to love. They're hard to be kind to. They're hard to extend compassion to. Maybe they've hurt us. Maybe we just aren't on the same page. Maybe we disagree. Sometimes it's difficult to live with the heart of Christ. Sometimes the heart of Christ has blockage. And maybe it's there because we are more self-absorbed than we ought to be. Maybe somewhere deep inside of us, we know that if, if we invest resources in other people, that's fewer resources to invest in us. Maybe it's simply because we are so distracted. It's not that we don't want to be kind to people. It's that we honestly don't even notice people. We're so busy. We have so much to do. Maybe it's because of pride or arrogance or, or for some reason we see people on a different level than us, which is so unfortunate. Maybe for some it's navigating this line between showing compassion and condoning wrong. That's difficult sometimes, isn't it? That's a difficult balance sometimes. We mistakenly think that truth and grace are opposing forces that we can't love people and still disagree with them. Jesus stood firmly for truth and he expressed selfless love and compassion to people. We can do the same. You see, when we allow these blockages, these things, these issues to get in the way of us extending the heart of Christ to others, The world sees us as Christians, sees us as the church, as self-centered, apathetic, judgmental. And you know what? People don't respond in a positive way to those things. You and I don't respond in a positive way to people who are apathetic or self-centered or judgmental. Certainly people outside of Christ aren't going to respond to Christ in a positive way, if that is their perception. People generally get loved into life change. And so the challenge for us today, the challenge for us every day, is to develop the heart of Christ and let that heart move us toward kindness and compassion. It begins with us realizing the compassion and kindness that God has had for us. You see, that gives us perspective. When we realize that although the details may be different in our story and someone else's story, the plot is the same. Apart from Christ, we are all ruined in our sin. But thanks to the mercy and the goodness and the kindness and compassion and the grace of God, we are made right. We are made whole. And it's that same goodness and compassion 
and kindness that we then become channels to other people, to the world. We're all in the same place. Christians are uniquely positioned right now to recast the image of the church by replacing perceptions of judgment and arrogance with genuine acts of love and concern and kindness. More importantly, there are people that you interact with, that I interact with every day, who need to see and experience, and yes, hear, the gospel. A few years ago, there was a front page article in the San Francisco Chronicle. It was about a bus driver in the city there, a metro transit bus driver named Linda Wilson Allen. She loves the people who ride her bus. She knows them all by name. She has her regulars, and she treats them with kindness and respect. Like Ivy. Ivy was in her mid-80s, and one day she was at the bus stop holding a load of groceries. Linda realized that she needed help, and Linda got out of her bus, helped her load her groceries into the bus. And now Ivy will let other buses go by because she waits for Linda's bus. Like Tanya, who was new to town and she was at the bus stop and Linda pulled up and she realized that Tanya didn't really know what was going on. She seemed lost. Linda struck up a conversation with her. Are you new? Yeah, I'm new. Hey, it's Thanksgiving time. Do you have any plans for Thanksgiving? Do you have anywhere to go? Well, not really. Well, why don't you come over to our house? Why don't you celebrate Thanksgiving with me and the kids? And she did that. And now they are good friends. The reporter who wrote the story rides on Linda's bus every day. And the reporter described what Linda has created as this community of blessing. And when the reporter asked Linda, where does this come from? Why do you do this? Why do you treat people this way? You, you know, you just have to drive the bus. Linda said, that comes from my time with God. Because every morning at 2.30 in the morning, Linda spends 30 minutes on her knees in prayer. Because as she says, I got a lot of stuff to talk about with God. And that shapes her perspective, and that shapes her approach to the other people. And so at the end of the bus route, every day, she says pretty much the same words. That's all. I love you. Take care. Now, how many bus drivers do you know who say, I love you? That might freak you out a little bit, right? But that's what she says every day. Now, think about what her job is like. Think about the potential frustrations of being a Metro City transit bus driver. You know, you probably have grumpy passengers. You know, they probably leave their trash all on the bus. There's gum under the seat. There's probably traffic jams all the time in a big city like San Francisco. And yet she chooses to have this heart of Christ, to extend kindness. And so someone says, I don't see the heart of Christ. Where is the heart of Christ? Let me tell you where it is. It's in bus number 45 rolling up and down the streets of San Francisco. But the question I have to ask myself is, is the heart of Christ right here? Is it in me? Am I extending kindness and compassion to others? Demonstrate the heart of Christ. And start today. Can you do that? Will you do that? Demonstrate the heart of Christ today. I don't know if this is true. I've heard this. Maybe you have heard this. Maybe you know firsthand. But I've heard that servers in restaurants say their least favorite time to work is Sunday lunch. That's when all the church people go have lunch. And again, I don't know if this is true, but what I've heard is, yeah, those church people, they're rude, they're not nice, and they're lousy tippers. <laughs> That's probably true. Start today. Maybe that means if you're going to lunch today, that you go out of your way to express kindness to your server. 
You look him or her in the eye. You ask questions. You show interest. And by all means, leave a good tip. Start today. There are people throughout our day that we have influence, that we have opportunity with to express kindness, to show the heart of Christ. And so after you do it today, do it again tomorrow and the next day. And began to develop the heart of Christ so that people, people won't be drawn to you, but they will be drawn to the one whose heart drives you, Christ. Today, if we can encourage you in some way, if we can pray for you, if today you are ready to give your life to Christ, we've talked about kindness and compassion all morning. God is the ultimate example of that by giving his son for you, for me. And maybe now you're ready to give your life to him, to live for him, to confess that you believe Jesus is the son of God, that he lived on this earth, that he died on that cross, but he did not stay in that grave, that he is alive today. And you're ready to be baptized, to be clothed with Christ. We'd love to celebrate that with you today. If we can help you,